Hello everyone and uh, back with, um, well as you can see, another uh, long play time limit and as usual I'm going to uh, basically talk through my thought processes in a lot more detail than I would do normally and sticking with the theme of the first game I played in this series I'm going to go for Tiger's Modern with G6, it's going to be our next DVD for Ginger GM so I'm going to stick with openings I actually play. Now, this is a very interesting move my opponent's done here, f4. And he's going for a kind of reverse Dutch Grand Prix setup. And when your opponent does something you're not expecting, this is a key rule even in the openings, f4 is a rare move. You should always think a little bit deeper and maybe not even continue in standard fashion. And if I continue with bishop g7, you know, d6 here, this allows white to get his ideal setup, which would be, I know this because I play this as white, with d3 and playing moves like this. So I know a very good move here is d5. This is a very good way in general to meet e4 and f4 early, this d5 move. Because now that he's played on with a pawn here, I can enter into, well, a kind of even French defence structure but I have not played e6, and that now allows me to go bishop to g4, and the advantage of this move is that when I play e6, which I'm going to probably play here, and I will play it here, this looks like my opponent's playing very quickly, my bishop is now outside of my pawn structure, and this is a very important thing, because if my bishop was still on c8, which it would be in a French defence position, my bishop on c8 is a very bad piece because it's kind of locked in this prison. Talking about prisons, I thought I'd dress as a scallywag today. It's because the boiler's down, we don't know you're heating. And I put the prison in. I know I get another prison reference in there. And um, instead now I, I have an opportunity to swap off my bishop, which is, um, well, not a very good piece for this knight. So my opponent's now preparing to go um, d4. But as in the French defence, that pawn could become a prime target for my attack. So I'm thinking now, do I go h5? reason I like playing h5 in these kind of positions is to take control of g4 and f5, which I want to use for both my pieces. Or can I do something else here? And I'm actually thinking now, maybe a more superior move. I mean, the, the setup I'd like to get is h5, knight to h6. This is ideal. So um, I could go for that. Another way I could play is knight h6 to f5 straight away because I want to be able to meet d4 with bishop takes f3, pawn takes d4, and then knight f5 when my opponent would not be able to defend his weakness on d4. He'd want to defend that weakness with bishop to e3, but if I've got a knight on f5, that will stop that. And I know this, again, from experience in openings. So let's just think what the best way to do this is. Now, one thing that puts me off playing knight to h6 immediately here is h3. So then I can take on f3, bishop takes, and go knight f5. Uh, but in that position, my opponent has g4. And if you're trying to follow this way, I'm thinking, this is, a, this is a, why I want to pawn on h5. So I'm kind of thinking here that knight to e7 is very logical because it keeps options of going h5 available and also it allows my knight to come in to this uh, very good square on f5. So my opponent's played this and now I'm going to come in with knight to f5. And remember, uh, I'm not worried about my bishop being trapped. I want my opponent to play h3. I really want him to play that move because... Every pawn move you play in chess weakens the square. And moving the h3 pawn really weakens the g3 square. And it, it would allow my knight a, a great possibility of jumping in there. Now, I think my opponent's gone for a clever decision. I was hoping he wouldn't do that. Because rather than allowing me to swap his knight, I now, okay, can swap off uh, like this, which is, is still absolutely fine for me. Because, look, this has clearly helped me to get rid of my bad bishop. Hence, this subtle opening where I haven't played to e6 too early. But I think it's clever of him to keep his knight. Because the pawn structure is closed, there's not many open lines, open files, knights are superior to bishops. So my opponent has, has played that, uh, I have to say, well. 
Now, um, what do I do here? Is he going to play? Is he going to play g4? I, I don't really want him to play g4. So first of all, I'm going to kick that knight away. Um, so I want that knight to 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 go back here. Um, okay, he's moved it back to h3. I, I don't think that's a very good square. It, it follows the rule. Knights on the rim are dim. And, um, well, I'm still going to play h5 because I, I don't want him to go g4. I want my knight... I want to keep that knight secured on that square. It's a very nice square. Um, so I want to just keep it there for as long as possible. Um, and I think his knight should be on f3, though, because he wants to have more control of the centre. But anyway, this is a normal position. It's probably about equal. Um, how, how am I going to continue here? Well, I've got to think of two main things at the moment going through my head. Number one, where does my bishop develop to? Um, you know, I would kind of like it to get to c5, but that's a bit unrealistic. Because if I ever go c4, ever, even trying to sacrifice it, I don't want to allow my opponent to go d4. Because then he has this grasp on the centre and I can't break it up. So for now, I'm just going to put it on e7. And also the positive of this is if his knight ever jumps back there, I can eliminate that knight. Bishop takes knight. So this is uh, going to help me. Uh, but the next thing is my king. Now, where does my king want to go? Well, I don't really want to castle kingside. Um, you know, I want to keep some potential. Castling kingside is probably okay, but... I think a more dynamic plan would be to castle queenside because then I might be able to play moves like f6 and g5 starting an attack on that area of the board. Now, there's two, again, two things I'm mainly thinking of here. Do I go queen b6 now with the idea of castling queenside or do I first go b5? Very interesting. Trying to start an attack on that area of the board. And then put my queen behind that pawn. That's the ultimate I want to get from the position. Now let's just check some tactics. If b5, he goes d4. I take on d4. Queen takes b5. Queen to b6 should be fine. When you play b5 early, you always have to watch out for a4. So that's another thing I'm just calculating. In that position, I'll probably go b4. And that gives me some initiative. I, li I like I like B5. I like this. I'm trying to get the maximum from the position. If I get my queen behind that pawn, I much prefer having my pawn on B5 than on B7. Because even though I'm going to maybe castle that way, I'm not in a rush to castle actually because it's very closed. When the position is closed, when there's no open lines, you can leave your king in the centre for a longer period of time because it's in not, not as much danger. Okay, well, here um, I could even go a5 if, if I so wish. But queen b6 looks lateral. Then here I've still got... I'm going to continue with my plan. Queen b6. And I'm keeping things very flexible here. Um, I could castle queenside. I may even castle kingside. Uh, I think I want to play a5, actually. Uh, I'm going to play a5 without thinking because this gives me... Now I've got b5, c5, and look at these pawns. I've got ideas now of playing moves such as b4, starting an initiative over there. I'm still not sure where my king goes. I'm not worried. My opponent is playing moves which are okay, but it doesn't seem like he has a plan. Again, so important in chess. I even say a... Um, bad plan is better than no plan. This is a philosophy I have quite often in chess. Okay, so he's made a poor move. Let's try to think what he's trying to do. Is he trying to go c4? I really don't think he wants to play c4 because, again, every poor move makes a weakness. He will give me the d4 square and the b4 square. So I'm not worried about that. Uh, I'm not worried about anything here. How can I improve my position? Well, I could start now looking at pawn breaks available. C4 for me is, is wrong because it allows him to go D4. I don't want to allow him to get a pawn on D4 unless I can capture on D4 and, and you know, attack his centre. So I don't like that one. Now, B4 is a very natural move because then I'm trying to get rid of the C3 square and take control of D4. So that's a good move. And also A4 looks quite good. Just trying to... Um, open up things on that area of the board so both b4 and a4 look good now uh instinctively i like a4 now why do i like that move well i think instinctively i've still got b4 available then 
but this stops any possibilities my opponent has of going a a4 himself which probably wasn't a good idea but instinctively i kind of like this move i'm now looking at castling kingside uh, clearly I, I i'm opening things up on the queen side so i probably don't want to go there my opponent's playing a natural move here he's looking at taking off my knight here i'm still not in a rush i'm even thinking my king is best on d7 because if he does take my knight on f5, I want to be able to take with my g-pawn. Um, and where is my king going to be safest? I want to connect my rooks. Um, I'm thinking now king d7 is the best square. I'm going to put it on d7. You can break rules in chess if they've got a firm foundation behind them. And by putting my king on d7, you could say I'm breaking a rule. But look, it's clearly better now because I've got two lines I could potentially attack on. And I certainly wouldn't want my king on g8 here because on an open line. I don't want my king on c8. It actually looks very nice here. It's tucked behind this nice, secure shield of pawns. And the one thing I'm very wary of when I put my king in the centre is can my opponent open up the centre of the board? No, he can't. So he's gone for opening up this area. And OK, I'm going to now take with a rook because I want to try to probe this pawn over here um i can't i've got to be a bit wary now trying to go rook here because he will he will then take on h5 so he, he's got my rook tied down uh but i'm gonna try and attack now a2 because he's opened up this area of the board with moves such as queen a6 maybe also b4 at the right stage is logical here this this could be another way to play um, now, my opponent's moved his bishop here. Now, that gives me the opportunity to go d4. And if pawn takes, knight takes d4. And if bishop takes, rook takes d4. When my pawn structure is very nice, do I want to do that? Or do I want to keep the tension? I, I, I think even other moves I've got to look at here. Like b4. Uh, if my opponent takes that one, I can take with a rook. And my rook can infiltrate looks quite tempting and if b4 he goes c4 well then i can consider d4 keeping things closed he hasn't got a light square bishop i like this plan because i want to keep the center closed my king is there and i want to be able to just pressurize a2 i'm trying to find a weakness in in his position and this this move i, I like the best because I want to continue with okay let's let's just double check this idea d4 totally closes the position down i have to say once i play d4 my knight and bishop don't have a, you know great potential but i have this pressure on the a file and my opponent's minor pieces his bishop and knight are not great either so we can kind of discount these minor pieces they neither none of these pieces have a good role to play yet um the main thing I'm going for is his weakness on a2. And now, well, I'm going to start attacking that. I think I don't see a reason why not. Let's just check he has no way in on the king side. I don't want to fall for anything over there. Nope, I'm not worried about that. So I'm going to go queen here. I'm threatening to take on a2. And also, I'm threatening to play b3. So he's got a weakness. I have a weakness as well. I do have a weakness, and that's the pawn over here. But... My weakness on h5 is easy to defend. My opponent's weakness on a2 is not so easy to defend. I mean, can he even defend it? If he moves his bishop to try and defend it, I can play b4. And I'm using the pin on the pawn. Now, one thing I will do after this game, I think it's always good to go over uh, my thoughts again. There's an interesting comment. I haven't had time to respond to them uh, yet. I try to get around to that soon. In the chat in my last video, thank you so much for the positive feedback. It's really amazing. It makes me want to do more of these, which I'll try to do. I'm actually going on a holiday for seven days, so I'm not going to be able to do many videos in that period of time. But I will continue this series of trying to get to 2,500. But there was an interesting question in the chat, and that was, well, when you went over the games afterwards, your thinking was different to when you were playing the games, the game at the time. And you're saying, why? Why, why was this happening? Well, the reason is hindsight. Isn't it such a beautiful thing for us to have some hindsight? And going over the game afterwards, you can have hindsight 
obviously, about um, uh, ideas you've been thinking of during the game. You can actually improve bit by bit. And this is a key, key, key way to get better at chess. Look at your games. Try to work out where you went wrong. Don't use a computer. Use this thing here, which is called a brain mind, and try to work out how you can improve in the future. Okay, so my opponent is clearly in trouble now. He, he's trying to move his knight back here, which reinforces my idea that the knight on h3 was bad in the first place. Now, I can take here straight away. Obviously a good idea. I can also play b3. Um, so which one do I want to do? Well, if I go b3, I'm going to get a pawn to a2. And that looks looks good, doesn't it? But... Uh, then my pieces are a bit blocked in on the A file. I think I want to actually just play the simple rook takes A2 because I want a piece to infiltrate into his position. Um, you know, having a pawn on A2 would have blocked my pieces in, but this way I've got pressure now um, uh, along this, this rank and my B pawn can just move. And if there's no reason to just try and create a queen here, I, I will certainly do that. Is my opponent threatening anything? No, he's not. So let's just play b3. Why not? Why not just play the simple move two squares away from queening? This is looking very good for me now. Uh, my king is proven to be safe because I've kept the center closed. Now that his knight's here, his queen is not threatening that pawn. I could consider moving my rook. Um, I can certainly do that uh, uh, in certain positions. Now, okay, he's played his queen to this square. If b2, he has queen b1. This ending should be very good for me. Should be very good, but I, then my pawn's a bit blockaded. I mean, I want to try to think about these guys as well at some point. Um, what I might do first is just push Harry one square. Uh, or is that going to be a weakness later on? Because I'm thinking if I go h4, he goes h3. Maybe then he'll be able to go bishop e1 and pressurise my pawn on the dark square in the ending. So I've got to think ahead like that. Don't necessarily want to do that. Um, is it time to go rook b1 now? That's quite tempting. Rook b1, I kind of like that move. Why b1? Because it supports my pawn. And if he ever blockades my pawn and tries to take my queen, my rook will be better then. It doesn't seem to do a great deal on a1, but a1's okay as well. Now, rook b1, can he get counterplay with knight g5? I want to stop all counterplay, so we've got to calculate this with the idea of taking here. Well, let's have a look. If he does that, I can then play bishop takes, pawn takes. I can even move my rook back to h8 and I get rid of this knight. His knight, I think, is better than my bishop. It's closed position, so all in all, I like rook b1. It's putting my the rook behind my pass pawn. I just want to make sure when you're controlling a game like this, the key thing to do is don't allow your opponent counterplay if you can stop it. So you must always be really aware of every chance, every idea that your opponent might be trying to, to play. And... He is now clearly trying to get his knight in, but this is not going to be dangerous if my pawn queens. Um, now, I've got a simple way of playing. B2 is simple. It forces a queen exchange. Anything better? Well, I can go queen c2 here, but then, well, my pawn on c2 could actually be a target to knight e1, so I'd still be doing very well there. I'm really liking b2 because... I want to snug, you know, I want to snuff off any counterplay he has involved with queen coming over here. So by doing this, I tie his queen down. And now, okay, I could go rook a8. I could have done this before. But actually, I'm kind of thinking his pawn here is weaker than it was on h2 because I might have opportunities to take that. So I've kind of made him make a weakness. Now, what do I do here? There's a really a number of ways to play. I could take queens and infiltrate with my rook. Looks very tempting. I can also try to make some minor piece exchanges here. Is this working? Knight b4. Bishop takes b4. Queen takes b1. Rook takes rook takes here. I, I don't really want to leave him with that situation. Um, you know, rook a1 looks very tempting, but it's still hard to break through. Rook a1. I like rook a1, actually. I really like keeping my pawn here. 
let's just go rook a1 i mean maybe i could have played this you know this idea earlier but it does set up a threat of queen takes queen and rook to rook to a1 i, I meant rook a8 so i'm creating a threat and now that he's played here i want to go queen b3 because he spotted my threat I, re I, I reinforce my idea of, of playing rook to a1, which is a very strong idea. The queen is an awful blockader. It really is a bad, a bad piece to blockade with, you know, and this is an extra pawn I have. Things are looking very bad for him. Again, he can't create any counterplay, can he? My king is very snug here. My king is in its hoodie, you know, because the boiler's not bloody working. It's tucked away there. And things are looking very bad for him. Uh, with my rook coming to a1, uh, how does he stop that? I don't see how he stops this. I want to, you know, if he does play, let's think, queen e1, well, I'm going to play rook a1, I'm going to take his rook, and then I'm going to get a second queen. So this could now, it should now be terminal. But what I will do, I'll, for, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll think over, I'll go over the most important moments of this game verbally afterwards and i'll try to give you some nuggets of advice that you can take away with you you know in similar situations and i think verbalizing the moves is always important okay so my opponent i thought he might try something along this line which is a good idea it's a crafty move he's played bishop here and the idea is if i take here he's going to try to get his queen into this position now that's quite that's quite a good way of playing because I don't want to allow his queen in here, do I? Now I was actually preparing in this position to just go rook a1 anyway. Um, I don't want to give him any chances. I know I have a check here, but then he has g3. So if I go, this is his best chance, by the way. If I go rook a1, he goes queen takes b2. I take, he goes bishop takes, and I take his rook on f1. I swap queens. That should be good enough. So I'm going to continue with the rook a1 move. And this doesn't allow him any chances of counterplay. If you're winning, get the queens off the board. It, it, it makes the position simpler. Good bit of advice is, you know, when you have a good position, keep things simple. There we go. And uh, it, there's nothing he could do in, in, in that position. So, OK, let, let's just go over some of the key points um of this game i would like to say the last person i played on here in the video um did get banned for cheating in the end and so he bloody deserves it that annoying guy i was playing who's given me a bit of chat and then um you know uh, and then got done for cheating i mean i don't know why people why do people cheat especially when you get the opportunity you know i don't want to be big-headed but he's playing he's playing uh, against you know a title player grandmaster Surely a lot of people would like that opportunity to play against a Grandmaster. Why turn on Houdini and let Houdini blow him play against a Grandmaster? What satisfaction can you possibly get from that? So I'm very happy he got banned. I'm Also, that shows you people who say there's a lot of cheating on chess.com. I tell you what, I honestly believe chess.com. I did not contact them about this guy cheating. I didn't say anything. I think they've got the best cheating detection um in the business and i know this for a fact because i was approached by them a couple of years ago and they use very in-depth formulas and they got they spent a lot of money a lot of money um creating software that runs in the background to find cheats i think it's you know they got the most advanced software out of any playing site and i know they spent more money than probably any playing site on detecting cheaters and I think that's a good reason to play on chess.com. You know, as it as was shown in the last one, the guy who was cheating got banned within a couple of days. Anyway, let's go back. So, opening wise, when your opponent plays something which you may not have prepared against, try to find the downsides of that. The downsides of an early e4 and f4 in a lot of openings is you can play this move. Okay, let me just see if I can. Uh, okay, let, let's. I, I won't analyze lines. I don't see the point of doing that. It's more concepts I want to tell you and verbal explaining. If it's a very complicated game, I will go into uh, deep analysis, but not here. Well, d5, good move. And those of you who know the French defense, that is when you set up with e6 and d5. This whole point of playing this is not to play e6 too early, 
but instead to get rid of my worst minor piece, you should always be realising what are your bad knights and bishops, what are your good knights and bishops. Obviously try to exchange off your bad pieces and this can only help your position. I mean, there was an argument to be said for me actually taking this knight off, um, but I was trying to induce a weakness from my opponent. I was trying to encourage him to play h3 because if he ever does this, he leaves a hole on this square. And now standard developing from both of us. Um, and I think I get a very pleasant position here. Anyway, probably not advantageous for me. But when you're black, you get equality. You, you can't, you can't, you know, complain. Now, I also think I made a good decision um, when I finished my development here about playing this B5 move. Because we saw how my pawn storm on the queen side gave me uh, openings on that area of the board. Had I gone for my other instinct of playing queen b6, it would have been a lot harder to open up the position on that, air, on that area of the board. I then would have had to rely on pawn breaks on the other area, so f6 and g5, which a bit more risky because when I go f6, he can capture and it weakens e6, and g5 is very hard to play. That's an ideal break, but it's not easy to play. I mean, it still would have been all right. I mean, another thing, another nugget of advice is when you've got a closed position, all the pawns are on the board, you have a locked position. One of the main things you should be thinking of is where is my pawn break? And then is it a good pawn break? On the flip side of that, you should be thinking, where is my opponent's pawn break? If he doesn't have a pawn break, he's going to be struggling to find a plan. So I create opportunities here of a pawn break. And now I think b3 was actually an even an error. I think he should have kept his queenside pawns defending because now he weakens some squares. I play a4 and it gives me a target to attack. King d7, very logical. My king is actually safest in the middle here than anywhere else. And... Now I have this open G file. Given a chance, if he hadn't taken there, I may have even gone A3. Why would I have gone A3? I may have played this because I may have wanted to close the queen side now and concentrate all my forces on the newly opened open, you know, opening over here. As soon as a file opens, you've got to you've got to look at that file. So I might have gone A3, closing that area with the idea of going rook g8, rook g4, and doubling on this file. Why would I want to close the queen side first before doing that? Because I don't want him to open me up on the area of the board I'm moving my pieces away. Okay, so now, okay, he has created a... This is a target. If you see a target, attack that target. I see an opportunity to close the position down. And now things are very simple here. He's going to lose a pawn. Um, and as long as I'm careful here, I'm aware of any possibilities he has. The game is won. So I take this, I take this pawn, and the only thing I was watching out for is somehow his queen get in the game. There's no way he can do that. The position is still too closed. So if you've got a pass pawn, you might as well push the blooming pawn. And after queen here, rook behind the pass pawn is absolutely fine. But now this rook a1, you've always got to think of the, you know, another bit of advice. There's so many times myself and especially lower rated players throw away winning positions. The question I get asked the most is, I mean, it is along the lines of I get a good position in a lot of games, but I can never win it. What am I doing wrong? Don't relax is my key bit of advice. Your opponent will fight harder when he's got a bad position generally. Only relax when you've finished the game. Really, really, you've got to think harder when you've got one position. Stop counterplay. Extinguish any counterplay if you can. If your opponent does create counterplay, don't be scared to enter it as well. You've got to sometimes calculate. You've got to sometimes dive in and finish him off in complications. Just don't let your winning position affect the way you'd normally play. Uh, but if you can stop counterplay, obviously stop it. And obviously the rest of the game, pretty simple here. And we saw Rook A1 coming in. Bang, bang. Thank you. Thank you. Wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay, so that was all right. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for all your kind comments. Again, I'll try to keep this series going up to 2,500. I will go back to other time limits. 
uh, I'm away for seven days, so I'm gonna, you know, you won't be seeing many videos from me in that period. I've got, you know, I'm actually having first little break in a long time. So, um, you know, uh, hey ho, hey hum. But I will be concentrating on doing some of these videos because the feedback's been so great. Uh, and, you know, do do please be critical. I'm always trying to improve things. If you have any good critiques of how I could improve without being rude, be rude if you want to, but then you'll be in my, my hit list. Um, do tell me. Uh, I would also like to say this is not the uh, the YouTube idea I had in mind. I do have something else in mind, but it's going to take a bit of creating and I need some free time to do it. I, I'm building things up, but it, it's certainly operation in process and I, I'm hoping it will be uh, really good when, when I do it. Who knows? But we've got to try new things in life. Well, thank you for watching that video. Cheers. Goodbye. Until next time. Uh, yeah, I haven't got anything else to say, have I? Bye.